chapter 9, as we move on, Christ then is going to provide the way, the means, and the how of spiritual awakening to lead us into a relationship. So this chapter now presents to us the process, what this process is of God through another witness using the Holy Spirit and the Word, drawing a person uh, to make a personal commitment. As usual, he has scriptures to start with. Out of Joel 2, 12, and 13, Return to me with all your heart, with fastings, weeping, and mourning, and rent your heart and not your garments, for he is gracious. Uh, and finally, the thought out of James 4, 6, and 1 Peter 5, 5, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now Olson says, salvation is to be so satisfied concerning the main elements of truth about God and ourselves that we accept it in our intelligence. We agree happily to live by it. Repentance, and now he's going to define that. So underline that word. He's going to define what repentance means from God's point of view, not man's. Repentance is to admit to ourselves that God has been wholly right and that we have been wholly wrong, and to have a climax or a moment or a particular time. I've asked many people, when were you saved? And they said, oh, well, I've, I've, I was raised in a Christian home. I've always been a Christian. Well, that's wonderful. When was the time or the date or whatever when you personally came to Christ? Well, I don't. You mean a particular day or something? Yes. Well, no, my parents were Christians. I was in the home, gone to church all my life. I just loved the Lord. There has to be a climax of self-renunciation. There has to be a moment when you pass from death to life. Intelligently, you know what you're doing. Soon to be followed by the committal then of calling on Christ and moving into saving faith. But before this climax or time or moment can take place, there must be the process of thought. Will you underline those three words? The sinner must be given time, and that's why your witnessing must produce the basis for this thought. There must be processes of thought where we are in all honesty. We face ourselves and all the evidence that our minds have been exposed to concerning our relationship to God and our fellow man. Number one, <clears throat> a revolutionary moral change must take place in the process of coming to the climax or to the day or the hour or the moment of saving faith. Page 2.1. Those reconciled or rejoined to God are said to be in fellowship. Now, above that, write the word relationship. One of the strong things the faith teachers teach out here, and many people teach it, that there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. That might be in the language of today, but not so with God. If you have fellowship with God, you're having relationship with God. If you're having a relationship with God, you're having fellowship with God. There is no separation. Because most of the church <clears throat> has adopted the fact, well, if I sin, I'm losing my fellowship, but I'm still in a relationship with God. I'm like a crock that has a crack in it and some of the water is leaking out but I'm still a crock I'm a cracked crop <laughs> pot <laughs> whatever well that whole thing is a, an imaginary device that men have thought of that yes you can leak out you can lose some of your fellowship but you're still in relationship with God I said well what is it that's oozing out what is it that you're losing well because of my sin oh, I will so sir the Bible says if you sin you're dead you don't have any relationship anymore and so back in one of our previous courses I believe it's either the cross or the advanced cross we do a whole sheet on relationship and fellowship and give you scriptures to show that God's talking about the same thing. So above fellowship every time, make sure relationship is there. Those reconciled to God are said to be in a relationship, fellowship with God, and at peace with their fellow men. So let's look at John 17, 3. Everybody must come in. That's why we address the word to their intelligence that they understand before we make any moves. That's why the Bible says to lay hands on no man suddenly. We don't want him saved suddenly. 
I've let people go for weeks before I finally approach the actual climactic moment of getting them saved. I want them to know. I don't want to just bow their heads and try to get them in and send them out thinking they're headed for heaven when they're still living in a state of selfishness. John 17, 3, and this is life eternal. <clears throat> what is it? That they, mankind, might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's it. That's eternal life. Uh, let's do 1 John 4. This is uh, probably the, the best but they're all good. First John 4, 7, and 8. And this kinda is kind of heavy. It's repetitive, but it's good. First John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved or beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is or comes from God. And everyone that loveth, that's the Greek word agape. Well, the agape love is not talking feelings and emotions. Everybody that loveth with agape love would have to be one born of God and he would know or relationship or fellowship with God. He that loveth not, he that agapeth not, God's kind of love does not know God for God is agape kind of love, not just the feelings and emotions. Number two point, man has chosen voluntarily, voluntarily the pathway of supreme selfishness. Above that, just giant letters, put sin. He's chosen that path. He didn't set out to sin. He didn't set out to be selfish, but by not going to God, he's creating that lifestyle. And he has continually persisted in this selfish indulgence without any virtuous interruptions. He's never said anything in his entire sinful life. This person loves, now agape, he loves moral darkness. He turns away from light in an endeavor to deceive himself. He's got to cover up a tormenting conscience by doing other things, buying, 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 doing this, drinking, drinking, sex, sex, television, television, music, 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 uh, anything. John 3, 19 and 20. I think we read it before, but let's hit it again. And this is the condemnation that light, or above that you might want to write truth, that light or truth has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. And write the word why there. They love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the truth, the light. Neither comes to the truth or light. Why not? Lest his deeds should be reproved. Point number three, man is awakened to God consciousness as to the serious consequences of his sinful condition while in a state of selfish concern for his own nature. Again, that's why we preach, teach, and share sin. All right, let's start uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 6. These are all statements about the sinner. And this is one you have to use many times. It's very simple. Most everybody knows it, but they forget the simplicity of the meaning of the words. All, everyone in the world, have been born sinners. Oh, it doesn't say that? Okay. All we like sheep have gone. There's your active choice. We have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. When we're born, we're not in sin. We haven't developed that yet. That requires knowledge, understanding, and choice. And the Lord hath laid on Jesus Christ the iniquity or sin of us all. He's taken the total program. So we have all gone astray. We've turned. We've all gone our own way. That's something we have done. We cannot blame that on anybody else. Number four, God can only reconcile and have fellowship with one who is in a state of truth. If you need to underline that whole, if people don't want to mess with the truth, no use wasting your time. We've had discussions with people, and we finally come down to the place where I have to say, and this isn't original with me, but I have to say, look, if I could prove to you that God's word is contrary to what you're saying and that you're wrong. If I could prove to you, would you change your whole mind on this? 
And if they say no, then I wouldn't deal with them any further. But if they say yes, then my next question is, what would it take to prove to you that you're wrong? Would you accept, for example, the word of God? <laughs> See, yes, I would change if I could be proved. All right, will you accept the word of God as proof? If they say no, I will not go any further with them. I won't. Why? If they say yes, then I can take them to the word. And uh, that's what you have to know. So God can only reconcile and have fellowship with one who is in a state of truth or with one who is willing to have an intelligent and submissive attitude of love towards God and towards his fellow men. This is why Jesus told the disciples, when you're preaching in the cities and the villages, if they receive you, fine, stay there and nurture them. If they're not receiving you, don't get into arguments. Don't get into anything. Shake the dust off your feet and get on to the next city. Find somebody. Now, the man who sponsored me for the radio broadcast in Battle Creek had no idea I had a burden for Battle Creek. But he sponsored me for that five weeks of broadcast, five days a week, 30 minutes a day. Then we went down and had two different meetings to have a class there. We got one on correspondence course who couldn't come nights. Nobody shows up. So the man ultimately emails me and says, how are the classes going? And after writing back and I have to tell him, there is no school, nobody showed up, we're not having classes, I'm moving on to another location for classes. And he writes back and he said, well, he just tore into me, he says, you give up and you need to get on and blah, 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 blah. And I said, hey, let me quote you a scripture. If they don't want it, then move on to some place else where they want it. Don't stand there and argue, waste money and time trying to provoke people to show up. You give them five weeks of broadcast, they've heard it, they've written in for material and outlines, and they don't show up, then you know what you're dealing with. Get out of there. No problem with that. <clears throat> five. Sin must be viewed intelligently and hated intelligently. We must forsake sin because we are fully convinced that it is absolutely wrong and that a state of holiness or conformity to God's reasonable requirements is absolutely right. Pop right over with me to Isaiah and look at the first promise that God makes to Israel here who are in a state of, of uh, well, a state of disorder by the time Isaiah comes along. God says to them through Isaiah, Come now and let us reason together. That's intelligence, see. Saith the Lord, Though your sins past be as scarlet and present, they shall be, if you come and reason with me and make a change, they'll be white as snow. Though they be your sins are red like crimson, yet if you come to me, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, there's the key. You shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's coming from a God of love who doesn't want to lose them. But he must tell them up front what it is. Luke fourteen twenty eight. Christ uses a good illustration here. He says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first of all, and you intelligently count the cost, whether you have enough to or sufficient to finish the tower. You're going to approach the whole job ahead of time, figuring out whether you've got the money to build it. Less happily, after he's laid the foundation and he's not able to finish it, that all behold it and begin to mock him, saying, this is the man who began to build, and he was not able to finish it. Or what king, before he goes to war against another king, doesn't sit down first and consult whether he be able to have able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an image, ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. Oh, please, I don't want to fight you. He's talking about learning something intelligently, looking at the facts, looking at it with your mind to see what it is that you want to do and where you're going to go with it. And this is an admonition to us, but we don't tell this to sinners coming in the kingdom, do we? We don't tell that. We're so happy to get them saved, happy to get them in our church, happy to get them a tithe envelope. We wouldn't tell them to stop and consider whether they're going to go on or the cost of coming in. We don't tell them the cost. We just tell them to bow their heads and repeat after us. 
We wouldn't tell them the cost of having to serve Christ. That would wipe out 95% of the people that want to come to the Lord if you told them what the cost was to serve God, free of sin, not to sin, stop sinning. They, they couldn't buy that. They're hearing too many messages about Christians can continue in sin and they're automatically forgiven. Romans 6, 16 through 18. Paul lays it out pretty heavy here to the church at Rome. Don't you know, know you not, that to whom, God or the devil, to whom you are yielding yourselves by the choice of your will, you're yielding yourself as a servant to obey God or Satan, his servants, God or Satan's, are ye to whom you obey, whether it's of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were chained, see, servants of sin. But you have, past tense, obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, the word of God, which was delivered to you, the doctrine about sin, the doctrine about judgment, finally the doctrine about the cross, Christ. Being then, as a result of your change, made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And the church today would throw up to have to believe that. Well, we're not righteous. We're not holy. We're not perfect. All right. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul is writing to Timothy and says, the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to other faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is our whole theme at Faith Tech, the purpose of the Bible College. Is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. We teach that you will learn and go out and teach others. That's how we get started overseas. Now, on page 3 at the top, we're starting with point 6. <clears throat> as we're developing the spiritual awakening. As we allow ourselves to be intimately, individually, personally exposed to the sufferings of Christ because of our sins... Through the illumination of the Holy Spirit working with the Word of God, we are drawn through the painful process of self-discovery towards the gateway of repentance or total self-renunciation, and we emerge into a happy spiritual life of forgiveness through the commitment of faith. Now, that's a long sentence, but notice the word allow, as we allow. That's choice. We're going to be drawn individually. We don't come by a group, family. It has to be an individual thing to understand why was it that this man, Jesus, came? Why was it that he died? What was the result of his death? And how does that personally affect me today, see? It goes on, and Olson says, It is a passing out of death unto life, spoken of in John 5, 24. To be born again, you're passing out of death into eternal life. It is God's way of delivering us out of the authority of darkness and transferring us into the kingdom of his Son, of his love. And we see this over on the left page. Take this home. Uh, Olson has given us a drawing here. Uh, and you see the drawing starts at the bottom. And the, and the arrow starts going to the left because he's moving away from the cross deep in selfishness and sin. It's the me first attitude. And then you see the turn, which means he's now turning to find out something. His conscience is pricking him. He's uh, using his will to search. And you see the uh, cloud of painful self-discovery as he comes up his own sin until finally he reaches the cross. But follow that arrow. Read those scriptures because that's a very good transitional list of scriptures to use. So on page four, he has a major point, too, right at the top. In the process of salvation, there must be then, there must then be a recognition of our moral relationships and responsibilities, number one, to God, and number two, to our fellow man, because that's the whole sum of love. That's what Christ said, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, love your neighbors yourself. So we got to have that recognition of who we're responsible to first and then next and follow through with it. Number one, man must cease to reject the moral force of his nat natural discoveries and be willing to conform his life to them. He's got to stop rejecting light 
and he's got to be willing to conform his life to them as he discovers them, sees that they're true, they fit in, then he must advance on. That's just like training a child again to walk, to talk, to read, write, mathematics, whatever. If the child doesn't conform to the math or the alphabet, he'll never get the whole thing mastered. He'll never be on a computer writing letters if he doesn't learn the ABCs and one, two, threes. The Bible's the same way. And, of course, again, that's Romans. You might put that right off the side. Romans 1, 18 through 20. That's what that proves. Three verses proves that to you. That God has already given man an enlightenment inside. He just keeps shutting it down, doesn't want it as a sinner. But he's got it, the inside revelation and then the outside, so that he's without excuse. Number two, man must receive and admit all the truth that he understands. The, the Bible to reveal concerning God, understands the Bible to reveal concerning God, concerning his guilty and hopeless state, and concerning the advent or the first coming and sufferings of Christ. Page 5, chapter 9, third major point. An acknowledgment of total responsibility for our sins. This is necessary. We don't want to hurry this in a service. This is why we don't have them just bow their heads. Each person should be dealt with personally. It's not that people couldn't be saved in a group, but they will have to go through this particular point to, to acknowledge, to repent in their prayer to God that they have committed these sins against God and that they're personally guilty. It can't be for Adam or mom or dad or husband or wife or anybody else. To come to this conclusion is a very painful one and requires an honest approach to our situation. If we can blame our sin and guilt upon our constitutional nature or weakness or upon the circumstances or environment, upon injustices in God's moral government, or upon the secret permissive will of God that sin should come in the world, if not God's direct will, then we have found a legitimate excuse for our sin and can escape from an acknowledgement of total personal guilt. And it's that acknowledgement of total personal guilt that's going to get you saved. Any effort to get away from my personal guilt before God, I'm not moving with him. In this state of mind, the self-condemnation which must precede repentance and the total committal of faith is totally, completely impossible. You'll never get them there. You'll never get them there. You must be in a state of self-condemnation against who you are and what you've done to God. Otherwise, you'll never make it in. But you see, the church tries to grease them up with God loves you. Jesus loves you. You can all be saved. He made it possible. Oh, my dear friends, just bow your heads right now. Nobody looking around. Oh, don't you just feel like crying? Well, just repeat after me. And they don't really get saved, most of them, because they never come to grips with their own personal sin against God. Number one, all self-excuses for our sin must be eliminated before we can possibly acknowledge ourselves as totally morally bankrupt before the great God. That is, we have nothing at all to approach him with until we confess that. A, we cannot blame our sin on any constitutional nature or weakness which we may have inherited. The depravity, the fact that we are depraved and twisted and bent away from God and have no relationship with him, that's that's fine, but that is not the cause of sinful actions. B, we cannot blame our sin upon the circumstances or environment we live in. It must come back to the individual choice. Can't be environment, circumstances, inheritance, anything else. Occasion is different than cause. Number C, or letter C, we cannot find complacency by saying that sinful guilt has been unjustly charged against us in God's moral government. What's being preached in the church is all of you sinners have been born a sinner because of Adam. And they go on and on with that. You've inherited sin through your mom and dad, grandpa and grandma. And when you do that, you're building up a barrier against the truth of God that makes it impossible to come to God in humility and godly repentance and godly sorrow. But most of the church preaches that. It's a lie. 
It's a lie Satan has put in the middle of religion that you're born a sinner. It gives a defense for the sinner not to come to God. How unjust this is. I'm caused to sin because of somebody else. That doesn't even make sense. You wipe that away from somebody and you finally got the manhole cover off their filth and they can stick their head up in the light and begin to see things for the first time. You aren't born a sinner. You're a sinner because you chose to become a sinner. See? Well, I live in a bad environment. Yes, that's an occasion. They're all drug dealers here and prostitutes and so forth. But that's not the cause of your sin. You're choosing to stay here. You're choosing to sin. Ezekiel 18 tells us, doesn't it, in verse 20, that the father shall not suffer for the sins of the son, and the son will not suffer for the sins of the father. Everybody for his own. Page 6, point D. We cannot find comfort in our guilt by the thought that God may have been in some sense at least partially to blame for the entrance of sin into the world. How could Jesus weep over Jerusalem if he caused them to be sinful and rebel against God? How could he say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, like a mother hen would have gathered her chicks under her wings, so I would gather you, but you would not. He gave us no hint of God's planning Israel to sin and falling away like that. Point number two, <clears throat> we must understand that sin is always, will you highlight that dude? We must understand that sin is always a wrong, voluntary, free will attitude or purpose of life, which we alone can change by a revolutionary choice of our will. As sinful as we are, we can make a choice to come out of sin to righteousness. Every and anybody that's ever been saved in this world in the past 6,000 plus years have been saved by the choice of their own will. God never forced or pushed or dragged anybody into the kingdom because if he could do it for one, he could do it for all. If he knew he could do it for one and he didn't do it for all, then God's guilty of sin because he that knoweth to do the good thing and he doesn't do the good thing, unto him it is sin. When I was in a state of sin, I pursued. I gave it 100%. Somebody said, well, did they have drugs back in those days? Not that I know. If they did, I'd have tried it. <laughs> did they have pot? No, if they did, I would have tried it. Anything that had a top on it and unscrewed, I tried. I tried every sin there was. And I pursued in it till. September the 5th, 1959, the morning I took our kids to church and condemnation was there because the pastor preached the truth and I'd been raised in churches, raised with the name of God, believed all the scriptures about Jesus, never knew you had to be saved, didn't even know I was really a sinner. My conscience was just killing me. It wasn't hard to get me saved that morning when I heard the truth for the first time, something my parents never told me, that I was a sinner, dead and gone, and the only way back was Jesus Christ. They would pat me on the head and say, Robert, you're a good boy. Yeah, I went to Sunday school and church, went to church three times every week, memorized all the scriptures in every class, memorized them faster than anybody else. But I didn't know I was a sinner. I never heard the word. <laughs> Under 2A, Old Testament words describe man as a rebel against a loving God, not as a subject of pity who has lost his ability of will and thus could not help sinning. B, New Testament words likewise stress the idea of the wickedness and inexcusableness of sin. C, underline this opening thing now. All sin can be resolved into a wrong ultimate choice to seek our own happiness supremely. Every sin is because I want something more than anything else and I'm going to get it. That's what sin is. There's no concern for God. One time I worked at the E.W. Bliss Company in Hastings, Michigan as the safety director. And one of the guys out of my brother's church, evangelical United Brethren, uh, he came to me one day, and I knew him. He came to me and he said, Brother Bob, why don't you come to our church this Sunday? And I was married with three little children. He said, why don't you come to our church? And I spoke to him and I said, let me clean my life up first and then I'll come. And I meant that, you understand? Because I realized, man, I don't want to go to church because I was at the height of my sinfulness right at that time. I didn't want to go to church the way I was. So I was, 
honest in saying, let me clean myself up first, but totally deceived. <laughs> you understand? It became an excuse, really, but I wasn't using the excuse. I just didn't want to go to church the way I was. And the, the terrible thing was he said, okay, and walked away. He had no more response to that because that's how he got saved. He went down to church when he got saved. Point number four. A realization of the awfulness of our self-centered lives. This is what's going to take us to, this is what we walk through with spiritual awakening. A realization of the awfulness of our self-centered lives which must precede the climaxes of repentance and saving faith. Somewhere prior to being saved, we've got to get to the bottom of our pit. We've got to see what it is we've done. That can be done by introspection, but it can be done best by giving you the word of God of the results of the person who's in sin. The soul that sins shall die. The soul that sins shall be separated from God. The soul that sins will be in torment forever. All those scriptures about sin. By the way, I have home uh, something I'm going to print. I just found it on the where I'd put it on the uh, computer, and I'll print it out for you. It's a thousand scriptures dealing with sin out of the Bible. I'll print it and give each one of you a copy. One thousand scriptures in the Bible, old or new, dealing with sin. That's what a person has to get a hold of. Number one, endless personal experiences and observations of the external universe awakens our mind to the greatness and goodness of our great benefactor, God the Creator, and begins a process of humiliation and self-abasement. Faithful Christian witness to the realities and truths of the gospel furthers the process of self-examination and conviction. That's usually the first attraction for the sinners, to see somebody living it. They may laugh, they may mock, they may make jokes, but you're going to live it day after day. You're not cussing, you're not smoking, you're not swearing, you're not telling the dirty stories, you're not doing any of the things he's doing, and he realizes something different. And yet you'll talk to him. And yet you can joke with him in other ways, and yet you can work alongside of him. And eventually they've got to start asking you, what's so different about you? Are you, are you a Christian? Where do you go to church? And you have to take the church thing out of it right away so you can take it back to their own heart. Number three, the Bible is a revelation from God to man through men moved by the Holy Spirit that wrote it, become the instrument in the hands of the Holy Spirit and faithful Christians through which all the world may become accountable to God. Underline that. All the world may become accountable to God because of the Scriptures. Number four, God's reasonable approach towards man in the Bible inspires the mind to think through every problem of doubt. Underlined every problem of doubt. I thank God before he got me involved in going overseas or got me involved in evangelism in California, I spent two years working as a small business consultant for the Travelers Insurance Company out of Santa Fe, uh, California. And I learned for the first time, I didn't learn this in Bible school or seminary, I learned for the first time to be able to sit down with somebody across the desk like this and sell them insurance policies. And what one of the primary things I found out is when we got right down to the signing point and you'd told them everything and you'd answered all the questions, you would hand them the pen and say, just sign on the bottom. And the pen would be laying there in front of you, and, and before he'd pick it up, he'd say, well, what about this? And I would reach over and pick up the pen and bring it back over here. Take all pressure off of him. Answer his question. Got anything else? No, I don't think so. Lay the pen out there again. Say sign on the bottom line. Oh, uh, just one more thing. Pick up the pen and brought it back. What I learned was, you can answer the doubts of all men concerning the, any problem they've got with God. As you increase with wisdom and knowledge, and I think the moral government of God is a great leap in that when it brings it all together for us in 15 chapters of the process, you can stop anybody's doubts and answer them if you know the word pretty good. But out in the church today, it isn't answering the doubts. It's making Adam the blame, their parents the blame, the environment the blame, 
and uh, poor you, uh, God will save you. Jesus paid it all. Uh, why don't you just bow your head right now and let me lead you in a prayer. Follow after me. I know you don't know what to say. Bless God. Uh, and then so the man follows you in a prayer, and you get through and pat him on the back and say, you're saved. You no more saved than a sheet of paper. You've got to be able to handle the doubts because when you do, he's getting that in his mind. It's going down in his conscience, and what you tell him is being measured by what's in there in God's consciousness. And when it's truth, not the error of the church, but when it's truth, the bells ring down there. And like a computer goes, yes, this matches. Yes, this fits. And you're taking it away from him. Again, when you hear the facts today that after somebody gets saved, the average time is somewhere between 5 and 10 years, and only 15% of the people make it after that. 85% fall away within the first five years because nobody tells them the truth, and they're still dealing with their own sinful nature that they're living with, and they're gone. Number five, the compassionate earthly life and teachings of the Lord Jesus is God's final final approach to the mind of man to demonstrate what true holiness is like and to convince not to convict but to convince man of the emptiness and stupidity of every other form of life or right right behind that religion it's the final approach to the mind of man Jesus Christ six the sufferings and grief of the Godhead over man's rebellion and persistence in sin as revealed from the beginning to the end of the Bible should reinforce the reasonable approach of God with such moral force as to break down our hearts in abhorrence for every hour we've contributed to the unhappiness of the great divine personalities who, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, only desire to love and bless man with their presence. That's the greatest reward he can give us, is to be connected to him. And finally, point number seven. We'll close and take a break here. The blessed atonement of Christ, the cross, as made living and real by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, leads us into an experience of togetherness that enslaves the humble soul to the great love of God. The atonement of Christ becomes the greatest, the cross, of Christ becomes the greatest moral force that has ever been devised. Only the cross can awaken us from our voluntary sleep or self-ignorance and lead us to the discovery of our total moral bankruptcy. Now, it's possible that the movie, The Passion, could be the beginning for a lot of people. We pray that it is, don't we? That that movie may grab every person in a state of sin and cause them to stop and rethink. But they've got to go back and begin to get in touch with God's word to bring that rethinking to any fruition of repentance, humility, confession, and receiving Christ.